My name is Rebecca Sadoon. I'm a resident in the Departments of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at Duke University, and this is a Learning in 10 on the evaluation of the child with a new limp. By the end of this presentation, you will be able to recognize the significance of new onset limp in a pediatric patient, develop a differential that includes the most common as well as the most dangerous causes of pediatric limp, and describe how to approach the evaluation and workup of a child who presents to your clinic with a new limp. In the course of this talk, we'll discuss what makes limp in children different from in adults. We'll talk about the case of a four-year-old who presents with a new limp. We'll discuss the most dangerous as well as the most common causes of limp in children. We'll talk about the basic physical examination skills for children with a limp, as well as laboratory and imaging to help make the diagnosis. And finally, I'll leave you with some classic cases, both vignettes and radiographic findings, to help you think about pediatric limp. When things differently about limp in children versus in adults, adults usually present with an orthopedic injury and typically can tell you about how they stepped off of the curb funny or twisted their knee. Children, however, 20% of the time, the limp is the first sign of cancer, a serious bone infection, or congenital bone condition. It's important to take these limps seriously and to evaluate them appropriately so as not to miss an important cause or a dangerous cause. With adults, we typically, because of the orthopedic origin, would say, take some Advil, come back if it's not better in two weeks. With children, however, we do a much more rigorous evaluation up front. We can discuss the case of little Timmy, a four-year-old whose mother brings him in saying that he started limping yesterday. She thinks he might have hurt himself when he jumped off of his jungle gym. She says he's been less active than usual over the course of the last week or so, and when you ask him more questions, she says that uh, he may have had a cold last week and maybe had a little bit of a fever, but she doesn't really remember the symptoms well. When trying to diagnose limp in a child, it's important to first consider the life or limb-threatening causes of limp, and these include severe infections like septic arthritis or osteomyelitis, cancers, including leukemia, metastatic neuroblastoma, and primary bone tumors. And for orthopedic conditions, think of fractures and developmental disorders such as slipped capital femoral epiphysis, or skiffy, the developmental dysplasia of the hip, and we should also consider non-orthopedic conditions such as appendicitis, testicular torsion, or an epidural space abscess. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or GIA, can also cause pain in one or more joints, leading to a limp. When you have a child who presents to you with a new limp, in many ways your first job is to rule out the bad stuff, to think about the life and limb-threatening causes and make sure you can convince yourself they don't have one of those before making a diagnosis of a benign or common cause. The common and much more benign causes of limp include post-infectious synovitis of the hip, and this typically occurs in the days to weeks following a upper respiratory infection, simple sprains or strains, as well as bumps, bruises, cuts, or superficial infections like abscesses that cause pain and therefore cause limp. If we focus only on orthopedic conditions, we can first differentiate the causes based on whether the limp is painless or painful. A common painless condition would be DDH. An easy way to remember the risk factors would be the five Fs. Female, first child, breech fetal position, positive family history, and low amniotic fluid index. Causes of a painful limp can be divided into the different age groups. For preschoolers, think of transient synovitis. For primary school children, Think of leg calf perthes disease, and for secondary school children, consider slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Of course, the more dangerous causes, trauma, infections, and cancers, must be considered in all ages. When thinking about little Timmy and his limp, it's necessary to have a balanced approach considering both the common causes and the dangerous causes of limp. You can also recognize that Timmy is four years of age, which is the mean age for new onset limp and that this age is very challenging both in terms of obtaining a history and performing a physical exam. And finally, you're going to want to try to identify the source and the location of the pain, which of course can be difficult given Timmy's age, but is extremely informative.
Timmy's age puts him at particular risk for osteomyelitis, leukemia, appendicitis, as well as synovitis of the hip. His mother's history did suggest a possible source of trauma, that of jumping off of his jungle gym, but if you think about Timmy and his typical week or any other child, they commonly do jump off a jungle gym, bump into a tree, and don't commonly get injured as adults or older children might. Though a parent, as in this case, might recollect a trauma, often they're looking for an explanation in their mind for the limp, and so this trauma can be associative as opposed to causative of the injury. Therefore, even if a parent tells you about a possible source of trauma, if the trauma doesn't sound severe, if it doesn't sound bad enough to you to have caused a serious injury, it's important to look for other causes as well. It's also important to obtain a history of fever, as this will help you in developing your differential. So what further questions can you ask Timmy or his mother to help tease out his symptoms? First, you can try to understand the fever as well as associated symptoms. If you were to learn that he'd had one to two days of low-grade fever, this might be consistent with appendicitis. So you'd want to ask if he'd had an appetite, if he's been vomiting, if he's had constipation. If you heard about three days of increasing fever, this would be most consistent with osteomyelitis. You'll want to ask how high has the fever been, is there localized pain or inflammation or redness. If you learned that he'd had one to two weeks of waxing and waning fever, this might be consistent with leukemia. And so you'd want to ask about the fever pattern, about bruising, gum bleeding, rashes, or other associated symptoms. And if you'd learned, as in this case, that he had viral symptoms before he developed his limp, this might be consistent with synovitis. So you would ask about a runny nose, sneezing, a sore throat, or anybody else in the household or at school who had been sick. When examining the child with a limp, you'll want to examine the affected joint, as well as the joints above and below, and those same three joints on the opposite side of the body as well. Also, unless you're certain that the pain is coming from the foot, you would want to do a complete abdominal exam, testicular exam, as well as examining the sacroiliac joints because appendicitis, testicular torsion, SI joint pain, and spinal epidural abscesses are all possible causes of limp. Whenever possible, you want to watch the child walk. You want to test for active versus passive pain at each joint. And you'll want to test for tenderness to palpation, recognizing that with a child, you'll usually want to distract them while testing for this to help you determine the severity of the pain. When thinking about laboratory and imaging for the limp, you're likely to start with a complete blood count and differential for nearly every child, and this helps you think about infections or leukemia. You'll also want to obtain an erythrocyte sedimentation rate and a C-reactive protein, which can help you to differentiate between infection versus inflammation. If you're concerned about osteomyelitis, which would be very painful to the touch, you'll want to obtain blood cultures. If you're concerned about septic arthritis, you'll want to obtain joint fluid. And you'll often want to obtain a screening x-ray just to rule out a fracture or dislocation. However, in other circumstances, it may be necessary to get additional imaging. In the case of the hip, an ultrasound can help you demonstrate an effusion though it can't necessarily differentiate between synovitis versus septic arthritis, and a contrast to MRI would be useful in helping to differentiate between these two. When evaluating trauma at the knee, an MRI is necessary to see ligaments or meniscal injury. And if you're concerned for osteomyelitis, during the first two weeks, it would require an MRI to visualize the infection. Only later, when destruction to the bone has occurred, would you pick it up on a plain x-ray. Here are some vignettes of classic cases of pediatric limp that you'll want to learn to recognize both for exams and for patients you'll encounter. I'll leave you with this to review in your own time. Similarly, here are some radiographic findings that are important to be able to recognize. They'll be both on the boards and things that you'll encounter clinically and I'll leave you with the opportunity to review these on your own time. In summary and in thinking about little Timmy, you always want to maintain a high index of suspicion 
and test for malignancy or infections. With Timmy as with any kid presenting with a new limp, you'll want to obtain screening labs including a complete blood count and differential, a SED rate, a CRP, and if you measure a fever or hear a history of fever within the last 48 hours, you'll want to obtain blood cultures as well. You'll likely want to obtain some screening imaging, usually in the form of x-rays, unless you have concern for a knee injury, osteomyelitis, or an unclear hip effusion, in which case an MRI can be extremely useful. You'll want to pay close attention to a patient's age and the presence of fever or other associated symptoms, as often they can guide you in your diagnosis. This is the case with little Timmy, whereby both his age and the history of a week's worth of upper respiratory symptoms might point you towards post-infectious synovitis of the hip. You'll certainly still want to obtain a CBC, a SED rate, and a CRP, and if they don't point towards infection or malignancy, you'll likely want to obtain an ultrasound of the hip, expecting to see synovitis. If all of these pieces fit, you might explain this to Timmy's mother and follow him closely for the course of the next couple of weeks to ensure that the symptoms resolve. You'll also want to explain to his mother that should he develop a fever or any new or concerning symptoms, she should be certain to bring him back for further evaluation. That concludes this Learning in 10 on evaluation of the child with a new limp. If you care to learn more, here are some further resources you can reference.